The Bible reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Uh, over this series, I'm going to be trying to put putting together the Bible readings uh, in a way that helps you follow the logic in a kind of flow chart. Uh, you'll find that printed there in your service sheet, and uh, you can follow along in your pew Bibles or your own Bibles. Sorry, they're not pew Bibles, your own Bibles at home. I'm going to be reading from that flow chart sheet. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, for we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You've already heard about this hope in the message of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and recognised God's grace in the truth. You learn this from Epaphras, our much-loved fellow slave. He is a faithful minister of the Messiah on your behalf, and he's taught us about your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience, with joy giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an outline that should appear there in your uh, service sheets or on your screen. Uh, there's a comments box down the bottom uh, of this web page and you can send any comments, uh, questions, feedback you might like uh, in that comments box. I'm at point one on the outline. Uh, Patrick Sang and Lee Troop are both coaches of marathon runners. Sang, a Kenyan, coaches a large group of runners, but his star is a man called Elliot Kipchoge. Kipchoge is the greatest marathon runner ever. He's the holder of the world record, the Olympic gold medalist in Rio, the only man to run a marathon under two hours. He's only ever finished first or second in a marathon and second only once. Lee Troop is an Australian. He coaches in America. His best athlete is a man called Jake Riley, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, Jake was an unsponsored athlete coming off years of heartbreak near misses and he placed second in the American Olympic marathon trials earlier on this year, one of the hardest trials in the whole world. Now, both of them successful coaches were asked what they did with their athletes after a successful race. Both of them said they always went back to what had worked and reapplied it each time. It was an answer that surprised many when they both said it. After all, with success, you can afford to change and adjust and try new things. But these coaches both emphasised the same truth. Don't stray from the basics. Paul says exactly the same thing as he starts his letter to God's people in Colossae. Let me pray. Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that Paul was a letter writer with Timothy. Thank you that the letters you desired have been preserved for us. Father, as we eavesdrop into this communication between uh, Paul and Timothy and the church in Colossae, we pray that you remind us of the basics to continue on in the way we began, to hold on to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who leads to the forgiveness of our sins. Father, help us to hold on to the basics. Amen. Just as grasping the genre of Psalms over the last three weeks was important, so too here. This is obviously a letter from the time of the early church. Look at verses 1 and 2. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The authors are clear. It's Paul and Timothy. Paul's an apostle. We know from Matthew's biography of Jesus, which we've just finished last term, that this means he's an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He's sent to tell others about this man, Jesus. Paul didn't choose this role in life. It was by the will of God. Acts chapter 9 recounts the intervention of God in Paul's life, a moment when the persecutor of the followers of Jesus met Jesus as resurrected Lord and was completely transformed and became a proclaimer, not a persecutor, of Jesus Christ. Paul's life now is about representing Jesus. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus, representing Jesus as the one who lived, died and rose as God's promised one to deal with the broken state of the world. Timothy is his brother, a co-worker. They're writing to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae. The recipients have a physical postcode. They live in Colossae. A Colossi is near Ephesus in the region of Asia, around about modern-day Turkey, a small rural town which had in the previous hundred years been a lot larger. A cosmopolitan, renowned for its purple wool, devastated in AD 61 by a massive earthquake. The recipients also have a spiritual postcode too, don't they? They're in Christ. It's one of Paul's favourite descriptions of Christians. Their whole identity is bound up with the fact that they are connected to Jesus Christ in such an inseparable way that they live in him. They're in him. Everything about them is driven by this fact. And this spiritual postcode means that whilst they live in the physical postcode of Colossae, they can call God their father. They've been joined to other like-defined people who also call God our Father. They're in a community. They've been granted life, grace and peace in a way that they were designed for but did not deserve. Put simply, Paul and Timothy are writing to a bunch of Christians living in a small town in what is probably modern-day Turkey. Now, Paul's got a pretty standard opening section for all of his letters except for Galatians. He usually opens with a prayer of thanksgiving. In the letter to Colossae, he follows this tradition, but then he has a second prayer which flows out of the first. I'm at point two on the outline. The first prayer begins in verse three. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Paul and Timothy are praying a prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer of thanksgiving because they've heard about something in the Colossian Christians. Look there in verse four. For we've heard of. They pray this prayer to God who is their father because they recognise that he is the mover of all they're about to give thanks for. And look at what they give thanks for there in verse 4. For we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. They thank God for two things about the Christians in Colossae, that they have faith in Christ Jesus and a love for all the saints. And those two things come because they have a hope reserved for them in heaven. It's worth unpacking what's going on here. It seems that the Colossians have had a change of their future plans. They now face the future with a hope, not an airy-fairy thing, but a certainty. This has been displayed in their lives now in a relationship with a person and a group of people. On the one hand, their future is connected with the person of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, that connects them to a bunch of like-minded people who also have a trust in Jesus Christ and they love them. On every level, these Christians seem to be travelling pretty well. A report's been carried to Paul, we'll see how in a moment, and it drives him to thank God for these people that we'll soon see he's never met before. I mean, what a testament to how well you are going as a church when news of your faith and your love and your hope begins to spread out into the surrounding communities, even to the greatest known capital of the world, to Rome. You'd be going okay as a church if that happened, wouldn't you? But that's not how the Colossians have always been. Something has changed in them. They've heard something. In fact, there was a time they had not known something and now there is a time that they 
do know something. You've already heard verse 5. You've already heard about this hope in the message of truth, the gospel that's come to you. It's bearing fruit and growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and recognised God's grace in the truth. You learn this from Epaphras, our much-loved fellow slave. He's a faithful minister of the Messiah on your behalf. He's told us about your love in the Spirit. There was a time when they'd not heard something and now they have heard it. The key to the change in the Colossian Christians is something that was spoken to them, something that was taught to them, something that's transformed the known world. They've heard the message of truth, the gospel, the good news. It's taken hold of them. It's changed them. They'd come to know a man called Jesus and they trusted him. They'd been brought into a community whom they loved. Their future destination had been transformed when in the past all they'd looked forward to was death. And at the heart of this gospel is the truth of God's grace. There in verse 6. Now from the way Paul and Timothy speak, this was something that they had not known, nor was it something that they had previously recognised. Something has happened and now they do know this grace. What is this grace? Well, we'll see in a moment a fuller statement of it, but grace literally is receiving something that you do not deserve. At the very moment, you deserve something else, and it's come from God. The transformation was not limited to this corner of the Mediterranean. It's a message that's been transforming the world, transforming the people of the world. Did you see that there in verse 6? It's transformed, changed, and grown the people who held on to it in Colossae, doing the same right throughout the world. Not proclaimed to them by Paul and Timothy. Did you notice that in verse 7? It was proclaimed to them by a man named Epaphras, a local. In fact, Paul's never been to Colossae. It's highly likely that Epaphras heard about the gospel in the nearby town of Ephesus when Paul spent about three years there, Acts chapter 19. He then seems to have gone back to his hometown. We hear this in Colossians 4 verse 12 and shared the good news of God's grace with the town. He's then shared it somehow and probably with a visit with Paul. The nature of the change that's happened in Colossae is people have heard this gospel. It seems that as Paul has visited, he's shared the news about how people have come to meet Jesus and trust him and love each other and had their future transformed. Epaphras seems to have shared details about this with Paul. And so Paul writes this letter and he seems to do it from Colossians 4 verse 10 whilst he's in jail, which probably places him in Rome around AD 60. At the heart of this opening prayer of thanksgiving by Paul and Timothy for the Christians in Colossae is the good news of God's grace. It's utterly transformed this mob. And at this point, the change is remarkable. The news has spread. This mob are doing really well. That prayer of thanksgiving then leads into a prayer of request of transformation. Look there in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you. The consistently echoed phrases in the prayer that follow, and you can map them out yourself, are very similar phrases in the prayer of thanksgiving and the prayer of request. It seemed to be a reminder from Paul and Timothy that just as how these people have started out, so must they continue. Continue in the way you began. Here is a church going great guns. Much to recommend it. Obviously growing as a community under Jesus. And because of this, Paul keeps praying for them. So what does he pray for them in light of that thanksgiving? Look there in verse 9. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience, with joy giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. One major request there in verse 9 that these people who are already doing really well as God's mob might grow in their knowledge of God's will, that they might grow in the gospel. 
Paul prays this one request for one result there in verse 10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, live a life that pleases God. He then unpacks what that looks like, helps his readers understand what it looks like in a string of statements in verses 10 to 12, bearing fruit, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened by God, giving thanks to God. Now, the structure is very clear, but it's worth spending a little bit of time pulling apart some of these observations. First, Paul's desire is for these people to grow in their knowledge of God's will. He wants them to spend time in such a way that they'll better understand God's plans and purposes in the world. In fact, it's not just a period of time spent like this, but their whole lives spent like this. Their lives as people with Jesus as Lord are to be lives that grow in the knowledge of God. Second, that growth in knowledge will be through the gospel, through fellowship with others who know the gospel. That seems to be the implication. Now, as we see throughout the letter and in our modern understanding, that means growing in understanding God's will by reading God's word and spending time with God's people. Their Bible wasn't our Bible, though. They had the message that Epaphras had brought them, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we'll look at that in a moment, which Paul had given him, and this slab of truth was the revelation of God's will. Their growth in knowing God was to be through this. In fact, right throughout Colossians, we'll see that Paul tells them never to leave this truth for a moment. Hold on to the good news about Jesus Christ, of God's grace that is truthful. Hold on to it tightly, always, forever. And he seems to assume that his readers in Colossae, who've only got this stuff that was given them, can understand him and apply the truth. Third, this growth in knowledge was to be the foundation for behaviour. It was out of this growth in knowing God's will that their lives would be lived so that God would be pleased with their living. In fact, they would live more worthy of the one who they'd come to know more deeply. Theology, that's what this knowledge is, is inseparable from application. In fact, sometimes they're indiscernibly linked in such a way that they cannot be defined differently. There's no application without theology and vice versa. Fourth, this life worthy of God is spelled out in those four statements, to bear fruit in good deeds. Uh, we went recently uh, to a friend's a little orchard out the back of their place. You knew what the mandarin tree was because it had mandarins on it. You knew what the lemonade tree was because it had lemonades on it. You, you knew what the grapefruit tree was because it had grapefruit, the orange tree, obvious. You know a tree by its fruits. Someone who claims to know Jesus as their boss is always known by that behaviour. The good deeds are deeds done because Jesus is the one who is theirs. It's to grow in the knowledge of God. That's a practical application to grow in knowing God more deeply. Alongside bearing fruit, these two are images of inevitable, inexorable growth. Someone who knows Jesus will always grow, at least in what they know of their true God. It's to be strengthened by God's power so that endurance and patience are the result. Like growing in knowledge, this might be invisible. I mean, how do you know that someone's been strengthened by God's power until after the fact? But it's to express a trust and reliance upon what God has done that allows someone to patiently endure. <coughs> it's to be joyfully giving thanks always. It's to approach life in every facet. Remember, this was a man who's in prison writing this. It's to approach life in every facet with an attitude of gratitude to God. It's to fulfil facts of acts of Christian service with joy, not with begrudging obedience. It's to approach life with thankfulness and delight and joy, not lamenting the latest thing that God has developed. Now I want to pause at this moment and just take a brief digression. And uh, one day I was helping a mate pack his house in preparation for Bible college. Uh, another fellow who was helping made some comments and jibes about ministers being impractical because they just studied theology. Only farmers were practical. 
And it stands alongside the numerous times I've heard the lament after a sermon, just tell me what to do. It seems to me that this creates a false dichotomy between theology and application. It can drive a wedge between what we know of God and what we do as God's people. Uh, even more fundamentally, it misunderstands what practical application looks like. Theology is inseparable from application, but we must know God before we know how to live worthily of God. And that means that, furthermore, a, a valid application a biblical application of theology isn't always something to do. Paul says it there in verses 10 to 12. A valid application of theology might be something to know, knowing God more deeply, knowing his will more widely. A valid application of knowing God's will might be being strengthened by God's might, which is invisible to the human eye. A valid application of knowing God's will is to actually approach life with an attitude, unseeable, of thankfulness and joy. None of these are doing things. They are being things, knowing things, invisible things, ways of thinking and approaching. Now, even though the Colossians are doing well as God's people, Paul prays that they grow more in their knowledge of the gospel, more in their knowledge of God's will, so they live worthily of God. Now, throughout this opening section, I'm at point four on the outline, it's hard to miss the fact that the Colossian Christians are doing well. To borrow from my opening illustration, these people have run a great race. They are running a great race. Paul and Timothy recognise this. They give thanks to God for them, and yet... They pray a prayer of request for transformation for these Christians going so well. It's like those two coaches, Patrick Sang and Lee Troop, uh, <coughs> Paul and Timothy go back to the basics. Well, what do they pray? What's at the heart of this request? Well, in case you missed it, at the heart of both of these prayers is a clear statement that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is central. It's there in verses 5 and 6 and verse 12. In fact, in verses 13 and 14, we're given a very clear introduction to this gospel. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's a definition developed more fully by Paul throughout the rest of the letter, but at this point we can say that the gospel is this. It's a message about God. Did you notice that the heart of what Paul and Timothy say here revolves around God's work? God is the doer. He does everything in the gospel. It's his action that lies at the heart of the gospel. It's a message of rescue. Paul describes God's actions as actions of rescue. It's something that God has done in the past. He has rescued us. It's a message that applies to humans. God's actions are were and are on behalf of all people, people like Paul and Timothy and the people that they're writing to. It's a message of transfer. Paul's description of God's action on behalf of humans focuses on a movement, a change of postcode, a movement from one kingdom to another. That's the rescue. God does something so that humans move from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. All humans naturally live in the domain of darkness. They're enemies of God. They're servants of the devil. But God does something that changes this. God can move humans into the kingdom ruled by God's Son. That's reflected in that reference to the postcodes there in verse 1. You might live physically in Colossae, but you live in reality in the kingdom of God's Son. It's a message of lordship. Paul's description of the gospel rescue turns on the movement between bosses, who your boss is, the movement from one domain to a new kingdom, a movement from the domain of the devil to the kingdom where Jesus is the Lord, the boss. It's a message of forgiveness. At the heart of this movement is dealing with human enmity towards God, the dealing with human sin, the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not, that's separated us from God, that's moved us away from him. That sin needs forgiveness by God. 
who's offended by it alone. And in some way, and we'll see this next week as Neil takes us through a magnificent description of Jesus, in some way, Jesus Christ deals with human sin, enabling forgiveness for humans that they do not deserve. Remember God's grace? This enables humans to move from the domain of the devil into the kingdom of Jesus, and he is now their boss. It's a message of hope. The result of all this is that humans now live in Jesus' kingdom with him as Lord, having the hope of sharing in that kingdom forever. That's the gospel. It lies at the heart of Paul and Timothy's opening prayer in Colossians. It lies at the heart of the very letter itself. It's what the Colossians first heard which transformed them which they are to continue to hear as they live that out. It's the message of the good news of God's mercy in Jesus Christ that transferred them out of darkness into God's kingdom, which now transforms them as they know God and his will better. That's what this community of Christians who are travelling so well, that's what they need. They're already saved. They've already been transformed. They're already being transformed. They've already got a reputation for love and faith and hope and they need to hold on to the very basic truth of the gospel. Right from the get-go, Paul and Timothy are very clear about their intentions. You continue as God's mob in the very same way you started as God's mob by holding on to the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ has transferred you into the kingdom and the good news of Jesus Christ will continue to transform you in that kingdom. Now, we need to hear this because here in Narrabri, we are part of a Christian community that on face value seems to be doing well. We're a large Christian community with numerous formal and informal ministries when there aren't pandemics. We cover many demographics. (coughs) We've existed here for a number of years. We need to be reminded that at the heart of who we are, at the heart of what we are to offer, at the heart of how we are changed, at the heart of everything we do is this basic gospel, the good news of Christ Jesus who has dealt with our sin. So let me close with four simple questions for us. First, do you know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the movement from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son? Second, if you do know the gospel, does it remain at the heart of who you are as one of God's people always? Third, is the gospel our culture as God's people? The good news about Christ Jesus who has dealt with our sin and transferred us under the lordship of Jesus, showing us grace we do not deserve. Is the gospel our culture? And fourth, is the gospel what we are on about in all of our Christian community All of our ministries, formal and informal, all of what we do and how we do them. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the good news of Christ Jesus who lived, died and rose for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. An act of grace we do not deserve and a moment of transformation that moves us from the kingdom, the domain of the devil, to the kingdom of your son. Father, thank you that in the gospel you have acted for us. Father, help us to hold on to the gospel in all that we do as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.